My name is Jack O'Halloran, and I'm uh, hopeful glad to be listening to the Rock Stop with Chris Contra. All right, welcome into the Rock Stop. Chris Contra here. My guest tonight is Jack O'Halloran, who has been an actor, a professional boxer, an author. He's done a lot of stuff, so we got a lot to talk about here tonight. How's it going, Jack? Going very well, thank you. Yourself? I'm doing good. I really appreciate you being here. My pleasure. All right, so uh, you know, I, first and foremost, I did notice on your Facebook page you seem to be uh, you seem to be happy that the Patriots are going to the Super Bowl, huh? Uh, yeah, been my team for a long time. They're playing good football. They're a great organization. Oh yeah, it's just a they're a brilliant. They have a great coach. They have a great quarterback. They've got a great owner. It's just a very very good organization. Definitely, I mean, and a dynasty like I mean, I don't know if we've ever seen a dynasty like them. I don't think we ever have. It's uh, you know, it's and not just proof of the organization. And you know, when you look at their team. You could count on one hand how many number one draft picks they've had in that old team. Right. You know, he, this guy picks up people. He he picks down at the 28th uh, level and makes stars out of people. He's just a very good – he has a very good feel for talent, Belichick. Absolutely, absolutely. So do you think they have a good chance at winning, uh, winning, the, winning the whole thing this well, year? I think they'll win the Super Bowl. Yeah, yeah. I think they'll win the Super Bowl. And then they've got twelve draft picks for next year, so they they're really in pretty good shape. They were, uh, yeah, they got uh, they got a very bright future ahead of them, as if uh, they've already had a great success here in the past. Did you happen to see the um, the the Rams game last night? Yeah, no, I thought the Rams played a good game. You know, it was uh, I, I I thought it was a real bad call where yeah. New Orleans lost the game because of uh, because of a single call that should have been made that wasn't made right and it was definitely a it was definitely a foul and it should have been called and and that changed the game which is very sad but uh you know it is what it is that's football right right bad calls happen and that's just the way it goes sometimes so i mean it's speaking of sports and stuff i mean you're a very uh a big guy when you were growing up did you have uh did you play a lot of uh athletics yeah all my life i was uh I was a uh, football, basketball, track, all my life. Yeah, and and you just you just loved all sports. I mean, you you must have excelled. I mean, what did you excel at most? Um, I don't know. I, I held track records for forty years. I, I I played a decent game of basketball. I was I was a, a very good football player. Um, and I mean, you ended up becoming a professional boxer, which. Uh, which you did quite well, well there. I, I, I had my hand in pro football, and then I went into boxing, and so I, you know, I just uh, I was at both levels in, in two different sports, so it was it worked out pretty well. Yeah, definitely so. And uh, who who would you say were some of your uh, toughest opponents? Wow, huh. <laughs> uh, I fought a lot of good fighters. Yeah. Uh, I guess the toughest opponent I ever fought was myself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just uh, if I would have done things the way I should have done them instead of, you know, I used to take fights on a week's notice and stuff like that because I could fight and I just, you know, I was doing other things in my life. And, you know, boxing was a day guy, a day job, you know. Right. When I first started boxing, I, I was very dedicated. I was 60, I was undefeated in my first 16 fights and because um, I really had my nose to the grindstone and, but of course, they didn't pay you a lot of money in, for boxing in those days. So mm -hmm. I had a syndicate that paid me a weekly salary. But um, I don't know. I, I come from a, a very um, I come from a, a world of uh, a, a different kind of world than most people come from. Like, what do you mean by that? You're just the the way you were brought well, up. I had a very I had, I had a very very famous father and who was a serious. Uh, Mafioso Don, you know. I never got to really know him. Uh, he uh, he knew what was the outcome of his life was going to be, and uh, he put some very smart people around me that uh, taught me a lot of very very good things. And uh, he was assassinated in '57, and then 
he left me a lot of documentation that explained a lot of things and uh, a lot of very, very smart, very good people uh, got around me and uh, taught me a lot of very good things. And uh, I was very close to people like Meyer Lansky and Charlie Luciana and Frank Costello and people of that nature. And, uh, so I, I knew a lot of things and uh, seen a lot of things happen. And, yeah, you know, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a whole different world. And I watched the changes in our world. A lot of them I don't like. And uh, it just... Um, a whole different way of living your life and when you have and I was very very lucky in my life God gave me a lot of gifts right you know, and uh, some of them I abused and I shouldn't have and some of them I didn't and uh, you know everything I seemed to put my hand to worked out very well mm-hmm. you know, and I, I enjoyed the film business quite a bit and I yeah. had some great success in the film industry and you know yeah, I, I did. didn't have to go through I didn't have to go through a lot of twists and turns that a lot of people do with, you know, going to acting schools and stuff like that. My acting school was Robert Mitchum. Oh, <laughs> he yeah. He was my teacher. Was that he your, was my teacher. That was your first movie you ever did? Yeah, first film I ever did was Farewell, My Lovely. Yeah. Robert Mitchum. I turned down several movies before that. They came to me. They kept coming and offering me films, and I kept saying no. Why was that? And then, I, you know, I was I was boxing and I was doing very well fighting and uh, I was uh, I just uh, I don't know seemed like a, a different kind of world that uh, separated me from some other stuff and then when it came a world that 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 other world was changing too drastically it, it was better to do something like the film industry and yeah so 1975 I uh, I made a decision they came to me to do Farewell My Lovely and I had retired from boxing and I had um, had a disease called acromegalia which I had fixed up at the Mass General and so things were looking pretty good and I said you know why not and I went and did a screen test and Robert Mitchum said it's either him or I don't do the movie and, wow. and then he took me under wing and you know so, it's, I, so I blame him for it all <laughs> <laughs> but so- I had a great opportunity to do uh, the Thomas Crown Affair with Steve McQueen. Yeah, he wanted me to do that in the '60s when I was when I was just starting boxing up in Boston, and they were doing the Thomas Crown Affair. And Steve and I became very good friends. And he said, oh, you got to do this. You got to do. This. I said, Yeah, I don't think so. Then they wanted me to do a picture called The Great White Hope, is a boxing movie with James Earl Jones. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Jack Johnson story, and uh, they wanted me to play Jess Willard, and I came close, but I just knocked out the number two heavyweight in the world, Manuel Ramos, and uh, I was looking at a title fight, and they wanted me to go to Spain for six months, and I so I don't think that's too great of an idea, but yeah, probably should have done it. In, mm-hmm. On hindsight, I should have done it. Right. But, uh, you know, you just make decisions in your life, and, Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't look back over anything. I, you know, I did what I did, and who knows? Right. You know I mean? Farewell, my lovely worked out extremely well. Yeah. And uh, put me in the industry well. And the next picture I did was King Kong. Oh yeah. Which became a very big movie, and you know, it was, uh, I was uh, I, I just picked and chose pretty good movies to do, and oh, uh, definitely and they worked out very well. Yeah, I mean, uh, those are classic movies, and then of course the Superman franchise came along, which are, I mean, in my opinion, they're the best. The, at least the first two are the best superhero movies of all time. Oh yeah, they 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 are the best. There's yeah. no doubt about it. And you had a great, you had a great director, Richard Donner was. Uh, I mean, he lived, eat, and slept Superman. He and Tom Mankiewicz. Uh, we're a great team, and uh, it's very sad that the Salkinds were so short-sighted. And because if Donna would have finished two and would have went on, he would have done three, four, five, and six. It would have been a whole different franchise. Wow! You know, if, I mean, the fan base would have been through the through the roof. Yeah, because he was just uh, people got to understand. Superman was the very first American superhero. Right. And uh, and when they took away that all-American way and they, they changed it around and made it blacker and darker and darker, 
you know, it was sad. It yeah. was really sad because, I mean, um, he's not meant to be involved in killing people and all that jazz, you know? Right. So I, I just think that uh, it's just sad because we, we, we had the right formula. Yeah. And uh, it worked and it's true to work because here we are 40 some years later and people still, they, they go to the film, they love watching that movie. Definitely. You know, it's like an iconic they're iconic films. Right, so, right. So. And I don't think I don't think these uh, later ones will ever be considered in the in the ballpark of the uh, the first two. And it is a damn shame, like you were saying about uh, you know Donner not being able to complete his vision in the sequels because those really could have been something special. Well, you know, we've got a thing we're trying to do now. We want to because of this this technology with holograms, which is brilliant. Um, we want to. Uh, bring Christopher back on the screen and uh, pick up where we left off in two. And uh, we've got a great storyline and uh, we can bring the three villains back in a different light. And I've got a great twist in how we bring them back. we got a, a brilliant, brilliant storyline that it would open this thing up to, to really work very, very well. And uh, we're working on it. We can get the permissions and stuff out of Warner brothers uh, which I think eventually we will, then, uh, you know, it's going to be great for the fan base because they'll, to see Christopher back on the screen, they'll go nuts. And, you know, and, and for, you know, maybe people who don't know, you, of course, were playing, uh, you played the, the mute, the menacing mute non, who, uh, in case people weren't uh, sure who you played in the movie, that's who you were, the, yeah. one of the three super villains. Yeah, that was me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> of all the uh, villains, I think you had the most, um, uh, intimidating presence of of them all. Of course, Zod was the brains behind everything, and uh, Sarah wow. used her uh, many many assets. But yeah, the, Nan was a very very intimidating uh, character. Well, you know, I tell you, when I when they came to me to do that, and I, and I they said to me, "Do you mind playing a mute?" And I said, "Actually, I I embrace it because Jackie Gleason was a friend of mine, and he did a picture called Gigo." Right. He won an Oscar for it, yeah. playing a deaf, dumb mute. I said, boy, if I ever get an opportunity to get a character like that, I'll, I'm going to jump at it. And Nan was a perfect character because Zod was this vicious, vicious general, and Sarah was a man-eater. Mm -hmm. So somebody had to relate to the kids in the audience because it's a, it's a big child you know, deal. Yeah. So I took this ferocious brute and played him like a child. Yeah, you know, learning how to talk, learning how to use your eyes, and 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 learning, you know, like a learning child, you know. Right, right. And uh, and and people, a lot of people picked that up more than than they, you know. It worked out very well because I had so many people who come up to me and say, "My God, your character scared me so bad, but I love the character." Uh -huh. You know, right, exactly. It, it, it just it worked very well because they related to this child mannerism, you know. Mm -hmm. We were very lucky. It worked very well. Yeah. Now, would you say your uh, role in, in uh, the Superman movies was your most physically demanding performances? Uh, physically, yeah. Yeah, it was, uh, it was, it was, it was, a, it was a hard, the flying shots and all were, were you were hyperextending a lot and, you know, uh, the harnesses and stuff and uh, we, uh, it was, you know, we worked a lot of hard hours on that picture. Uh, it, I don't know. I, um, I never, I, I never, you know, all the pictures I've done, I, I like doing my own stunts and everything. And, uh, cause I've been an athlete all my life. So I never really, um, never bothered me that much, you know, in different things that I did. And, uh, but, but probably the most physically demanding was Superman. Yeah. 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 It had, uh, yeah, those those flying sequences. I mean, these days with the CG, it's a lot uh, a lot easier, I'm sure, for any actors. Uh, the way we did it, and they had a technology cord, it's called Zorn's Optic Vision, which shot Vista Vision on Vista Vision, and it worked really, really well because we were flying under bridges around buildings, yeah. and people were saying, where's the wires? Where's the wires? You know? so, yeah. but, but it was us, and you could see us, and, then, you know, it was... Uh, it worked. It just worked really well. The way they did it, and it was long and it was tedious, uh, but it 
uh, it was well worth it. Definitely. Well, well worth it. Now, the, the, the big controversy about Superman 2 was that uh, Richard Donner was fired during it, and then Richard Lester came in. Now, wh- how, was it, how was the change working from Donner to Lester? Well, it's like night and day. I mean, it was it was it was sad that they did what they did, and you know we had already shot like eighty six percent of the film, yeah, and they had to go back and reshoot it because for Lester to put his name up on the screen, he, a director has to have better than fifty percent of the movie on his scope, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. So they had to go back and reshoot a lot of stuff, and uh, and if you see the Donner cut, it's a much better film. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen it. Yeah, I, I, I have. I have seen it, and it 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 is very interesting to see. Like they they did the best they could with it with Donner's scenes, which he had some really yeah. cool scenes in there. But it, it did it did seem like a little bit of a patch job that. Um, well, it was the, the ending. The ending, he had you know he had to patch together because he didn't shoot the ending, and right. He, uh, I mean, it was. I mean, when we what was shots we actually shot was that. At the end of the movie, we had lost our powers and were taken into jail, into custody. Oh, and yeah. all they showed us was us falling down in that abyss. Right, you know? yeah. But they actually took us out and put us in a police van and took us away. When, when Donner was fired, I mean, were you, were you caught off guard? Were you shocked by that? I almost didn't return. I mean, Gene Hackman didn't come back. Uh-huh. I almost think back. I mean, uh, what should have happened is Christopher Reeve should have stood up and said, "No, Donner, no me." But he was young, and he was in. You know, they had to sell him a bill of goods and stuff, and uh, they paid him a lot of money. And you know, it's just uh, it's sad. He, he he should have stood up for Donner, and he should have turned around and just said, if, "You know, without Richard Donner, you ain't got me." Because and- Hackman Hackman did that. He said, "I'm not coming back." Mm-hmm. So ultimately, yeah. what was what was their decision? Like, why why was Donner fired? It's all about money. I mean, they. I mean, how do you cut Marlon Brando out of a picture? Yeah, right. They had already paid him. They already had the footage. They paid him already. They had the footage. They just didn't want to pay him the points. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so they cut him out of the picture, which so, was kind of stupid. So when you when you had to shoot some scenes with Lester, um, like what what were some of the scenes? Do you think he brought anything positive to it? I, you know, uh, it was hard for him not to, not to, to shoot stuff good because it was such a great cast. There was, you know, the ideas were all there, uh, but he, he put too much comedy in it. And I don't know. I just don't, you know, I, I, um, I didn't really enjoy working with him, mm-hmm. but you know, you got to do what you got to do. Right. Uh, he was not Dick Donner, that's for sure. <laughs> Definite difference there, yeah. On set, I mean, there's stories out there saying uh, that you and Christopher Reeve uh, did not get along. You know what? People have taken shit so far out of context, you know. We had one disagreement in four years. Uh, so I don't know very many people that worked together yeah. as tightly as we did for the period of time that we did, that one altercation that didn't happen exactly. during that period of time. Yeah, so that so we had one altercation. Of course, it was you know, it could have been very serious. It turned out to be kind of comical, but <laughs> uh, it was. Uh, so it's I all... had a very serious father. My father was a very serious gentleman, and uh, and we used to eat. I you know had a, an Italian restaurant in in London that was owned by friends of mine and. They were starting out, and so we used to bring. I used to bring all the people from Warner's in there to eat while we were filming. While we were filming, and uh, Christopher and everybody would go to food was brilliant. Everybody loved the place. It would just be, became a paparazzi joint. <laughs> and uh, Christopher was in there one night talking about things he shouldn't have been talking about. And the guy called me on the phone, and he said, "How well do you know this guy?" And I said, well, what are you talking about? He said, we're talking about your father in New York and mafia and this and that. And I said, oh, shit. So uh, the next day I, I took him into a room by ourselves and I and I had a conversation with him. And, and I thought we sorted it all out. And, and as soon as we got out in the hallway with a bunch of people around, he started, you can't talk to me that way. Up, up, like he was Superman. Yeah. <laughs> I said, yo. So I put him against the wall and I was just about... I was getting ready to smack the hell out of him, and Richard Donner got up and whispered in my ear. He said, 
not in the face, Jack. Please don't hit him in the face. <laughs> and then I started laughing. I dropped him on the floor, and I just walked away. I said, you know. Yeah. It's kind so, of ridiculous. To see, you know, <laughs> you know it's, it's, he's just a kid. He was a, you know, Christopher, there will never be another Superman like Christopher Reed. Right, I agree. He played Clark Kent and Superman to perfection, and he did that because of the direction of Richard Donner. Mm-hmm. That was his first movie, big movie. And Donner brought something out of him that he never did it again, I'll tell you that. He never got that kind of performance in anything else he ever did, you know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, Donner brought something out of him, that, and it worked. And it really, really worked. And I don't care who they, they, they they're just, they'll just never find another person that did that crossover so well. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it worked well. I mean, he was, and for someone who... That was just, well, it's like when I did Farewell My Love, it was the first time I was ever in front of a screen. Richard, I mean, but uh, Robert Mitchum showed me what I had to do. Donner showed Christopher Reeve what he had to do. Right. And it worked. Yeah. Farewell My Lovely, Farewell My Lovely was a very good film. The sad part was that Afghan Embassy didn't have the money to promote it properly. And uh, I... I could have been nominated for supporting actor for that picture, and my own foolishness. You know, Johnny Carson wanted to put me on his show, and I said no. I should have went on. I should have done a lot of television shows, and I didn't do it. You know, if you're going to get nominated, you got to do articles. You got to do this. You got to do that. Oh, yeah. And it was all there. I could have done. It. I should have done it because the part stood up. You know what I mean? It wasn't wasn't that I would be trying to sell something that I didn't do? The yeah. film worked very well. You know. At the end of the day, I had a lot of people that told me from the academy, "I'd have voted for you. I'd have voted for you." Well, why did you not put one ad in the paper? Why didn't you chase that rainbow? Right. And I just, you know, I was very, I've been cocky in everything I did in my life. You understand? Yeah. So I just, uh, it was a mistake. But you know, so, ultimately, the the performance lives on, and that's you know what's going to be most important. You know. Well, people still, you know, the I've never heard a bad statement about the movie you know what i'm saying yeah people still say to me today wow you such what a great film blah, blah, blah. yeah good, man you know? i mean yeah you definitely did some classic movies that will stand the test of time you know i, well, I dragnet was a dragnet was a good movie yeah you know we had a lot of fun doing dragnet with tom Hanks and dan Aykroyd. Mm-hmm. and i think uh the the one you did with uh chuck norris here in the tower yeah that was a good film. yeah i mean that's that's one that's considered Probably the best one. thing that chuck that's right. probably the best thing Chuck ever did. <laughs> that's, that's what I was gonna say. I think it's one of Chuck's best uh, best movies. People loved uh, Baltimore Bullet. Was a good another good movie with uh, Omar Sharif and Jimmy Coburn. As yeah. another film that they they just didn't have the money to to uh, promote it properly, which was sad. Yeah, because it was it was a good film and a lot of good people in it. You know, but but you're right. Superman one and two will be the most recognized because they were that big. Yeah. And Kong, King Kong wasn't bad. You know, it was uh, uh, we had a great cast. We had a great script. We just had a bad director. Who but directed Kong? Would have been Kong with John Gilman. Uh huh. Kong would have been a much better film, but they had a better director. Would have been a better film. Yeah, yeah. Do you do you remember uh, going to the premiere of of that or Superman? Like, how how exciting was were those moments for you? Oh, it was terrific. You know, just uh, you know the the fact that that you did something that really worked. Yeah. You know, and, and you know, it's, it's an, anybody's life achievement. When you do something that, that works, you know, it's, uh, and, and gives people a lot of pleasure. Superman movies give people a tremendous amount of pleasure. You know, it's just a, it's great to see the reaction of that. What you did really worked. You, yeah. did, it, you did it well. And what was so great about those movies, the the first two Superman movies, I think more than most, I'm not a huge comic book guy. I'm not a huge, uh, um, like I don't know all the backstory of all this stuff. And the the great thing about those movies is that you didn't need to know all that stuff. Yeah, no, yeah. that's what I'm saying. It, it just worked so well, you know. It just, uh, I mean, the way Donner lived that thing and put it together, it just was, uh, and, and it was a great cast. I mean. Having Brando play the father was a brilliant idea. Yeah. Gene Hackman was a great Lex Luthor. Oh, perfect. You know, the yeah. three villains. I mean, Terrence Stamp 
Terrence Stamp is a brilliant actor. Sarah is a very good actor. Yeah. You know, Valerie Perrine is a good... Every one of the... It was, the cast was brilliant. I mean, it, you couldn't get a better cast right. than that. Yeah. It was, you know uh, what I mean? Yeah. When when you were cast, was, uh, was most of the cast kind of already in place, or were they still bringing in new people? Did you know who was going to be Superman right away? No, they hadn't chose Superman yet. When we were we were cast before he was. Oh wow! Okay. I mean, there was a bunch of people that came in and auditioned. <laughs> they were, I mean, some of the people you would, I, I you would laugh if you knew about who they actually went to to try and do Superman. And it was, you know, you say, "Wow, whoa, why would you even think of that person?" <laughs> but they were looking for some a couple of people they brought in. They were looking just for name value, you know. Yeah. And the best part was that they did. You know, the cameo that, that, that Brando did gave them all the punching power they needed to put people in seats. Right, you know? right. Yeah, that, that was the And that then was Hackman. The Hackman was a great actor. Oh, yeah. You know, so the, there were some great actors. And even the ones that played the elders, some of them were Trevor Howard. And, you know, yeah. uh, there were some great actors that were in that picture that did small cameos. You know, so it, it just and it, it, the energy was great, you know. Yeah, it was just uh, Jackie Cooper was great. And oh it was, yeah, it, it, it all worked. It, it just worked well. E. G. You know? e. G. McCoy, Marshall, Mark, e. G. Marshall was brilliant. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he it was, was he wound up he wound up playing. And he was great. You know, it was uh, it was it was sad that uh, the people that started it couldn't finish it, so they brought people in to replace him, and and the replacements worked extremely well. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, yeah. Now, and, I mean. Mark McClure was great as Jimmy Olsen. Uh huh. Right. He was a young kid, and he had you know, you know. So it was. Uh, it just it, it was a brilliant cast that melted together very well. And I'll tell you, and Margot was great, Kidder. Yeah. I mean, you just when you work together with people every day for a couple of years like that, you become like a family. Right. Did you stay close and, to? Did you stay close to a lot of them? Oh yeah, Sarah. Sarah and I see each other all the time. Yeah, Terrence is Terrence is Terrence. Terrence is a little bit standoffish, but we're still friends. You know, I see Mark McClure all the time, and Valerie we used to see, but poor Valerie's not feeling. She's not doing well. Yeah, you know, so it's uh, it's kind of sad. And uh, Margot Kidder unfortunately just passed away uh, last and year. Maggie, Maggie, we were I was very close to Margot, and she just passed away, which is sad. You know? Yeah, I was I was uh, pretty right. surprised to hear. Uh, they, I mean, they called her death a uh, suicide. Actually, no, I don't think that. Was, no. That that was what was reported. I don't know. No, she was uh, she was not well. I was with her at a show in uh, Kansas City right before she died, and uh, she just was. She had done a. Uh, she was very politically oriented, you know. Uh-huh. And she did a, a demonstration with the American Indians, and and the whole demonstration was sprayed with something, and she became very ill. Oh. Uh, she wasn't well at all. And she just, uh, uh, it was sad. But you know what? She's in a better place. I'd rather see her passed on than suffer. I agree, yeah. And she wasn't doing well, and she was just suffering, and uh, and she had, her hips were bad, and, yeah. You know, just a lot of things in her body were falling apart, and you know, when she was younger, she was a gorgeous woman, mm-hmm. and she didn't like aging. You know, and it was a, uh, it was it was a sad deal for her. I I felt bad for her, but she was uh, she was very active. I mean, she went through some turmoils in her life. She was one of the most over medicated people, and she uh, became a big advocate of that. You know, there was a time she was walking around collecting garbage out of pails because she was so drugged up. Yeah. From different drugs that they had her on. Yeah, right. And she didn't even know what, what day she was going on, man. She was really in bad shape. And then she got off of everything. And she became a big advocate in Washington about that. Yeah. She, about her people being over prescribed stuff and stuff, you know? Right. Yeah. So she so- was, uh, but she paid a price for. Yeah. all the things that happened to her and she 
And she was a strong woman. I mean, I, I have a lot of respect for Margaret. I really do. I liked her a lot. Yeah, and I don't think the, the media was very fair to her. I mean, even like the, the you know, calling her death a suicide as the media has done. And all the, I, mean, I didn't, I didn't, I, I never saw that. I would have really jumped up and down if I saw that because that's, that wasn't actually true. Yeah, yeah. And I know it's I know for a fact it wasn't true. Yeah, I mean, I was very surprised when I saw that and they were reporting that, but, you know, that's what they did. Uh, you know, it was more bullshit media, I guess. And yeah, yeah, they just, they, they, they love to have some kind of an angle. And if somebody says something that is taken out of context, they jump all over it, you know? Right, right, exactly. And when she was going through her struggles, like you were talking about earlier, with, uh, you know, being picking through garbages and being over medicated and you know she didn't know what she was doing and the the tabloids just had a field day with that oh they did no 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 they they you know they, it was sad and yeah that I was, was glad to, uh, and i was glad to help her come through all that yeah and yeah. she came through it. she did she came right. through it in flying colors boy yep uh, you know I, like i said i have a lot of respect for her um speaking of some of the scenes in uh superman 2 uh that that I want to talk about that um, the helicopter the helicopter that was flying around that uh, um, Sarah you know she blew the she blew the kiss yeah. and then it crashed behind the um, was the, the helicopter was that a dangerous uh, was that a dangerous sequence? Not really because you, you you're looking at the real helicopter flying around up there, and then they did uh, they, they 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 tricked photography did very well yeah. They, it worked. It really worked very, very good. Right. Because the explosion in the building it was miniature. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Right. But I mean, and but there was a real helicopter on set, right? Oh well, yeah, no, there was a helicopter on site, no doubt about it. Yeah, yeah. it was. Because I mean, I remember yeah. you think about the. I mean, I did you know the tragedy at the Twilight Zone when they did the Twilight Zone the movie and Vic Morrow um, got killed right. by there was people died. That was very sad. Jogging. That was that was negligence. Yeah, that right. was pure negligence, and they. And they know they all got well. That the cost them a lot of money over that. That was, yeah, that was negligence. Yeah, right. I mean, that's that's why I brought that up. I thought like you know sometimes on these 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 movies. I mean, the Twilight Zone movie was a, a that was a big budget movie, and something like that should never have happened. And you see something, um, you know, when you go back and look at the scene in Superman, you know, it was done. It was done safely and properly. Because we they spent the money to do things right on on the Vic Morrow thing. They were cutting corners. Yeah. And uh, that was the boy. The producers should have been hung out to dry and never should have been able to work again in the industry. They, they, it was bad what they did. It was just not good at all. Yeah, I they were working longer hours than they should have. People were tired. They were cutting corners on shit, and it just you know that kind of stuff shouldn't happen. So, so after the uh, the success of Superman one and two. Um, came the the sequels three and four did you even bother seeing them no no well three was three was with richard pryor whom i like as an actor and he's good he was a good guy yeah but uh lester directed it and and it was it was it was such it was terrible but four canon did it, it wasn't warner brothers and it was just uh they didn't spend the money to do it i mean it was diabolical i wouldn't even <laughs> i never saw it i never saw the whole movie yeah saw bits of it one time but i said then i can't even watch it this is this is not good <laughs> yeah and i mean yeah you could you could see that it's uh they they did not spend any money on it i mean it really looked pretty horrible a lot of the uh the sequences and things and i even heard that christopher reeve only agreed to do that so that they would finance another movie he was doing called street smart and uh like he, like he wasn't even too keen on the idea of a fourth well, movie, it, it, it was it was a dumb thing altogether. You know? <laughs> yeah, that's that's about sums it up. It just shows you that you see the kid, he had an opportunity to do ten Supermen properly, and he should have done that, and he didn't. You no, know, you just you can't you can't cry over what didn't get done. You know, you just have to think of a way to do something better. Exactly. Um, I wanted to ask you real quick about Gene Hackman. I mean, that guy is such a great actor, and working with him on set, was he the kind of guy who was very method, or, or did he... Gene, Gene was a great actor. Yeah. And I did a picture of March or Die with him right before Superman. In fact, we went to London together to see Donner about the Superman pictures. We were doing a picture in Spain, and uh, 
Gene is I I, I love Gene. Gene was a Gene was a, a good guy, and he's a great actor. But he was a total method actor. He no tolerated no bullshit. You know. Yeah. If the director wasn't doing their homework, he'd walk off the set. Mm -hmm. you know, I'd say, "When you when you get your homework done, call me up." You know? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he was a, yeah. he was a good guy, and he got on with Donna really well. That's why he didn't go back to work. He wouldn't work with Lester. So no. yeah, yeah, not, I don't work amateur hour. No, <laughs> right, and uh, and so so when you guys went back, he was he was nowhere to be found. No, he wasn't. In fact, some of the scenes they doubled him on. Oh, really? A couple scenes where he was doubled, they showed the guy's back. They didn't show his face. <laughs> wow! In the fortress, in the fortress of solitude, there was a a couple scenes there that. That he should have been in, but they didn't. They yeah. couldn't because he right. wasn't there. He wouldn't do it. Wow. And um, so I was, I was wondering about uh, on set some of the like what what went on behind the scenes. I mean, who you got along? You said with the Sarah very very much and Margo. We all got all of us got on well. We all got on well. Yeah. Every one of us. It was like, it was like a family. I mean, one of the funniest uh, here's a funny scene what happened to us one day. Valerie Perrine came out one day. And her chair wasn't there with her name on it, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And she started squawking, like, you know, where's, <laughs> who, who, who took my chair? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what, what happened to my chair? And she was yiping up and down. My God. Da, 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 da. What do I, what do I have to do? She said, oh, she hears, she said, who do I have to fuck to get my chair back? <laughs> and so I yelled out to her, the same guy she did last night, just change the order around, darling. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, you, we, we could, you could do that. You could just, I mean, it was, we had a lot of fun. We yeah. really had a lot of fun, all of us. I mean, Valerie was a wonderful lady to work with. Yeah. And a fun chick, man. And a gorgeous lady. I mean, Valerie was a pretty woman. Oh, yeah. So we had a lot of fun. We we had a lot of fun. Sarah was absolutely gorgeous. Oh, stunning! Sarah, Sarah was a Sarah was a trip, boy. And yeah. we, you know, so we and we we banged around a lot, and we we had a lot of fun. We we're still we still have a lot of laughs, you know. That's great, yeah. And, um, and Terrence Terrence Stamp was one of the greatest actors to come out of England. Mm -hmm. Terrence was Terrence was brilliant actor. He had his problems with with drugs and stuff, and he had went away to. Indy he cleaned himself up. He he was rolfed and everything. And Superman was the first thing he did when he came back from all that. He was just brilliant. He was just absolutely brilliant. Yeah, yeah. He's just an actor, uh, and I have a lot of respect for Terrence. I like Terrence quite a bit. So, and, and just to you know set the record straight, like we were talking earlier, it, it, again how the press fucks shit up, and they said you know you. And Christopher Reeve didn't get along at all. But is, you want to say here that uh, it was a one moment type of deal, and that was it. Yeah, I mean that's that's the only time you know it was. I didn't. We, I mean, we weren't bosom buddies. I mean, he became a nicer person after he got hurt. Did you did you uh, did you see him much after he got hurt? Did you get a chance to? No, I, well, I was traveling around a lot. I lived in Europe, mm -hmm. so I didn't really see him that much. Yeah. No, but I, you know, uh, we we talked every once in a while. Yeah, and uh, you know, uh, he was, uh, you know, he was much kinder to people after he got hurt. I think he had a realization factor. Come to me. Oh yeah. You know? Prior to that, I mean, he would leave people waiting for him and things, and he wasn't kind to a lot of kids at times because he'd leave them waiting for them to show up somewhere and stuff and. And you don't do shit like that, you know, especially a uh, person who plays an icon like he did. Right. You know, he's, he's student, so, but, but that's not me even to judge him. He, that, that's up to him to do what he's got to do, you know. But, right, right. I um, all I know is his personality changed a lot after he got hurt. Mm -hmm. And he got hurt because of his own, his own ego. First of all, he should have been wearing a helmet, the proper equipment. He was overhorsed. He wasn't that great of a horseman. And he was on a very... Big, you know, horses are big animals. Right? Eleven hundred pounds on you, boy. Yeah, you better know how to. You better know how to ride them. And he's jumping. You're talking about jumping. Is it's an art. It's, it's science to it. You know. Oh yeah. <clears throat> so you know he he wasn't prepared like he should have been. And that's all ego. Oh, I can ride this horse, and I can. I don't need a helmet, and I can. You know, like like he's Superman. You know what I mean? <laughs> and he got thrown off the horse, and bam, he hit his. He's lucky he didn't die that day. Yeah. 
I mean, yeah, that, yeah, that was definitely shocking. And you're right. I mean, you gotta, yeah, you, yeah, you can't uh, just go on those things uh, sort of haphazardly. And uh, maybe he did that. Well, he did. I mean, he didn't. He didn't have. The, he, he should never get on a horse riding like they were doing jumping without the proper equipment. Right. And a helmet is is a mandatory thing. Great, if great riders wear the helmets, why shouldn't you? And, and it's, it's just kind of foolish. Definitely, and a very tragic consequence. So, I mean... Uh, it's like going to a sword fight without a sword. Yeah, you know? yeah, you're just asking for trouble. Yeah, I, I did want to circle back with you real quick because we were talking about your boxing career. Your your thoughts on the um, the current scene of professional boxing. I mean, it's changed so very much since, uh, you know, yeah, your I, day. I it has, but they, I mean, God, I'll tell you something. If they would ever pay me a million dollars to get in the ring, you'd have to bring a gun in to beat me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, it, it, you know, listen, they, these kids are making big money, and God bless them, but they don't, it's not as, to me, it's not as dedicated a sport as, as uh, I mean, when I was fighting, people loved fighting. I mean, yeah. there were there were 20 heavyweights that could have beat any one of these clowns that think they're champions today. Right. I mean, there were some great fighters when I was fighting. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, that's why I was so glad uh, to see Manny Pacquiao go back with Freddie Roach because he got his head straightened out, it cleared him up, and, and he looked great the other night. And I knew yeah. he would. You know, he was, uh, he, he he took Corona apart. It was like taking candy from a baby. <laughs> right. Or a guy 40 years old. Everybody said, oh, he's over the hill. He's 40, blah, 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 blah. Well, uh, he looked terrific, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah he did. He really so, did. It's, uh, you know, it uh, just shows to show you that, you know, if you take something serious and you put your mind on it correctly, you know, it is what it is. Yeah, right. When you talk about the how, how the passion, the passion was much different back in your day. I don't, I'm not sure you get any of that these days. It seems like the payday is so big, even to step in the ring, that the the reward for winning the match isn't even as great as what it used to be. They, uh, they, they're blinded by the wrong thing. I think. Yeah. So, and they don't fight enough. I mean, yeah. you know, you, you, I, I mean, I had, Jesus, one year I fought 26 times. <clears throat> I mean, you just don't, they, they're not, if you're going to learn a skill, you have to do it. Yeah. You can't do it half-assed. You can't do it, you know, temporarily or whatever. If you're talking about a skill that is, that includes your life here, you know? Yeah, right. Talking about something that could take your life away from you. Yeah, and and so, the, when you do uh, it, the less they do it, I mean, the more out of practice they're going to be and much more chance they can get seriously hurt. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, taking six you know, months so I, off. You know, and it, I, I took a kid, I had a kid I managed and trained. That's where Freddie Roach started. I started Freddie Roach with, with a kid named Frankie Lyles, huh. who was the super middleweight champ of the world. WBA super middleweight champ. Yeah. People, they threw him away out of the Kronk gym. And he was uh, training with the Goosens, and I, I I was working out every day at the time, and I was in the gym, and I saw him, and I said, wow. And I looked at this kid, and I shot him down. I said, son, I said, let me tell you something. If you do everything I tell you to do, I will make you a world champion in six months. Yeah. And I did. And I put together the corner with Freddie Roach and a few other people, and uh and we uh, and we took Frankie, and Frankie was champion for several years, and he and he he went right down. We went right down the list: one, two, three, four, five, six, and the top six, seven fighters in the world, and beat them all. Wow! Beat Michael Nunn. He beat everybody. Yeah. What What would you say your biggest I- advice? I mean, for a kid trying to start out in a, in a boxing, what, what was your biggest advice for them? You got to get with the, with somebody that really understands the game, a trainer that knows what he's talking about. Mm-hmm. And there's certain things that you need to do that they don't do. These kids, you know, number one is that, you know, when you're doing road work and stuff like that, yeah, yeah, you should be wearing old like combat boots. You know, remember the old combat boots, right? Because it supports your ankles and your shins. You don't get shin splints. Wearing sneakers is it breaks your feet down because you're you're talking about running a few miles a day. You know, yeah, and you shouldn't run on concrete. You should run on on dirt, mm-hmm. grass, yeah. dirt tracks, grass, beach, but don't run on the roads. Yeah, because it's pounding. You're pounding your body. Absolutely, it's, uh, not a good idea. You know, it's just, so. There's a lot of things that little things that 
that people have to learn that, and it's the focus and dedication of it. You just gotta, you have to, you have to focus on what you're doing on a daily basis and you gotta want it. You gotta live, eat and sleep boxing. If you're going to be a fighter, you, you, you're, you're putting yourself in a position where you can get harmed permanently in life. Yeah. If you don't do that and it's foolish if you don't, you know, great advice. It's like, uh, you know, I, I had a lot of fights, and people say, "Wow, you you talk good, man! You, how come you got all your marbles and all that stuff?" I yeah. said, "Cause I could fight. <laughs> Real simple. I could fight. You know." Yeah. But, uh, there's a lot of guys. I mean, Frazier is lucky he could mention his name when he died. It's sad. Yeah. A lot of guys that that, that were in bad shape from the punishment they took. Right. So I did want to talk about your book here. I want to give you a plug here for your book, Family Legacy. Family Legacy is a great book. If you haven't read it, you really should. It's uh, you can go on Amazon. It's a five star rated book. It's uh, it's going to be a great movie. We're going to do a great television series with it, and we got three more books coming out. Oh, really? So it's going to, yeah. It's going to be. It's it's not the difference. Is, you know, some people do mob stories. You know, yeah. This is not just a mob story. This is this is a story that tells how. The government, industry, organized crime, and unions were all partners. And how organized crime actually took their illicit money and put it back into the growth of a nation in the beginning. Yeah. They created the unions. So you got to understand something. When they started out, they were just doing gambling, extortion, and loan sharking. Well, you had to have money to do that. Yeah, right. You had to be able to pay them. So they made sure you went to work. <laughs> you know, yeah. they took guys that gave them construction jobs, put them on the waterfront. They, you know, they put them to work. Yep. They 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 contributed money at the Westinghouse, General Electric, Sears and Roebuck, the insurance companies. They they put a lot of money back into the environment of the of the, of the country. Yeah. And yep. no one ever tells that story. Mm -hmm. Everybody just wants to do this gangster shit. You know what yeah. I mean? Family yeah. Legacy is quite an interesting book. If you haven't read it, you, you'll enjoy it. Go on Amazon. Amazon, or just go to, if you go to familylegacythenovel dot com. It's a great site, actually. Uh -huh. It's a good site, and it takes you right to Amazon. And if you got a Kindle, you can get a Kindle copy of it. Just read it off of your Kindle if you do that. You know? Yeah, definitely. It's good. It's a good book. All right, cool. So uh, yeah. Now, I did want to go into a little bit of this JFK stuff with you. I know there's a lot about um, JFK that you've talked about. and Well, that's in the book as well. That's in the book as well. <laughs> so there Tell the is. truth about why he got assassinated. I do agree. I think that the uh, Warren Commission, there's a lot of bullshit in it. Um, I'm not bullshit. I'm not sure I agree with the theories I've heard about um, about really what happened that day. Now, let me ask you a question. I'll tell you something. Yeah. You look at it very simple, okay? Mm -hmm. If you wanted, if someone said to you, what one person, what one person could be looked at to be responsible for John Kennedy's death? What person would be the most, would be the most, could, contributed the most to Jack Kennedy's death? Who would you think it would be? The person that had the most to gain? The person who was responsible. The per well, a lot of people think it's Lee Harvey Oswald. No, no, <laughs> not at all. Lee Harvey Oswald was a patsy. His father, John, his father, JFK's father, was the cause. JF, Joe Kennedy was the cause of his son's death. Joe Kennedy pissed off a lot of people in his life. And the biggest thing, he, first of all, you got to go all the way back to the 20s. And Joe Kennedy's father was a very, Joe Kennedy was a bright guy. He was a banker. He married a very powerful woman, Rose Kennedy, whose father was the Honey Fitzgerald Kennedy, who was the, who was a gangster from Ireland and a politician in the, in Boston. And he controlled the Boston Harbor. And he was the first senator up in Massachusetts. Yeah. And he had the Boston the the, the Boston Bank was his. And he um, so so let me ask you. You're, you're saying that his own father had the biggest. Uh, his own father is the reason for his death, JFK's death. Yeah, yeah. And and he no, there's no question. Joe Kennedy was a a terrible guy. I mean, he lobotomized his own daughter. Well, for God's let me sake. just tell you something. Let me explain something to you. You know, he he, he started out. He started in 1920s. In the 20s, he was a bootlegger, and he 
robbed a load of booze one time that brought to a ground called the Purple Gang. And they said, you're a dead man, Sonny Boy. And he went to his father-in-law, and his father-in-law said, I can't help you. The only guy that can help you is in Chicago, the very first Don of Chicago. So he went out to Chicago. He sat down with Joe Esposito, and Joe Esposito said to him, you know what, kid, you're smart. And he was. He was a very, very clever banker. He said, you're a very smart kid. He said, you go home to Boston. I'll take care of the Purple Gang, but you belong to me now. And he hated being under thumb. The only money that Joe Kennedy ever put money into was the Mercantile Building downtown Chicago. And in 1925, he was asked to do something. <clears throat> he stole $5 million of Pate Newsreel common share stock in broad daylight. And Hamilton Club was a club out in Chicago, which was... Uh, but like the New York Athletic Club was political oriented club. Everybody hung out there, the president and everybody. And uh, they tested him. They wanted to see if he could do this with Pate Nuzio. He did it. And what they were doing was the United States was being pressured by Europe because Europe financed America, the bankers of Geneva. So Joe Kennedy was given a task to do. Yeah. They did a short sell against because they were being pressured. After World War One, America became a war bearing country. We started we 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 become a power now. And we became war bearing. So that meant we were going to start making war bearing equipment, planes, ships, everything. <laughs> All right. Now, yeah, yeah, let me ask you a question though. This is a lot to digest for sure. So let me just ask you. We're talking J yeah. JFK. JFK, his son, yeah. Joe Kennedy's son. With all this that you know, uh, talking about November 22nd, 1963, yeah. why on that day did he want his son killed? Okay, here's the deal. You could say, first of all, first of all, Jack Kennedy was not going to live out his term physically. He was very ill. They used mm -hmm. to shoot him up every day. He had Addison's disease. He had four different diseases, and he was dying. JFK. His father he, would rather see him die the way he died than him die of sickness and put a black mark on the Kennedy family. So you feel he, he, by having him killed, it made him sort of a martyr. And well, by by him being by him being he didn't have him killed. He made him a victim of certain things. Joe Kennedy made a lot of people very angry in in his life. Okay, right, and. Here's, here's a sequence of events that took place, is that his own daughter, he had his daughter lobotomized. Yeah, Rosemary. He had her lobotomized because she suffered from 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 a disorder that people suffer from every day, but they treat it with medication. Right. They didn't yeah. have the medication in those days, so he lobotomized her. She sat in an institution all her life. Yeah. Before she died. I know okay? that. That was. I know so, that. Yeah. He's. I mean, that was a horrible thing. Well, that's how cold hearted. That's how cold hearted this guy was. Okay. Uh, yeah. That meant, now, right. Now he orchestrated the crash of twenty nine through what he did in the political stuff that they had him do caused the crash of 29. Okay, so he was behind a lot of f fucked up shit. He angered a lot of people. Here he is, Jack Kennedy, comes out to California for to get nominated. Mm -hmm. Now, in the process of him being nominated, Joe Kennedy assured everybody that he had all the electoral votes in his pocket and everything, boom, was a slam dunk. He came out here, he gave suitcases full of money, he took suitcases full of money from H.L. Hunt for a guy named Lyndon Johnson to run as vice president. Gets two days into the nominations, and Joe Jack Kennedy's in trouble. They, the electoral votes he thought he was getting, his father didn't together as well as he did. We called Chicago, and he said to Sam Giancana, I'm in trouble. We need your help. Sam said, I thought you had this all taken care of. He said, no, I, I, we need your help. So Sam G. Connor, for the very first time in the history of politics, Illinois turned Democrat. Right. Now, as soon as he's president, the first thing that Gene Connor and everybody asked was, you know, what, what happens with this asshole Bobby? What are you going to do with him? He's already a pain in our ass with his, with his 
fight against crime bullshit. Oh, we're going to make him ambassador to Ireland. Don't worry, he won't even be in the country. Well, he made him his head. He told Jack, make your brother attorney general. And then he told Bobby, put all my good friends in jail. So he went after saying, Gene Connor, he went after everybody. Okay? Yeah. That's what. Then he turns around and he says to his, his son, Jack, those guys down there in Texas, all that oil money, they got this surplus oil down there that they're not paying any tax on. They're making a fortune. You got to put a tax on them. So they put a tax on surplus oil, which cost the people down there they're about $200 million a year. Lee Harvey Oswald was Apache. Lee Harvey Oswald's okay. mother was... Lee Harvey Oswald's mother hung around with a lieutenant of Carlos Marcellus in New Orleans. So that's how he got dragged into all this? No, he got dragged into it because he was... Lee Harvey Oswald worked for naval intelligence in, in, in Texas and New Orleans... There were clubs, gay clubs, that a lot of heavyweight military people used to go to. Well, it was not fashionable to be gay in the military at the time. So Lee Harvey Oswald used to dress up as a military officer with a microphone on him, and he would go and solicit these guys at bars and get tapes on them, and they were blackmailing them. He thought he was going to be, they did a series one time called I Led Three Lives. He thought he was going to be the next super spy in America. He, he hung around a guy named George de Mornchild. George de Mornchild was Zabruder's partner. Zabruder? The guy who did Zabruder tape. The Zabruder tape of the Kennedy so you're assassination? Saying, you're, saying, you're saying Zabruder was not just filming. He was something else going on. No. Zabruder never held a camera in his hands in his life. I mean, you realize this is, uh, I mean, it's been spoken about. I mean, he was interviewed. Let me tell you something. Listen to me very carefully. And I know this for a fact. Zabruder never had a camera in his hands in his life before. Two women were holding his legs because he suffered from vertigo. He never took his finger off of the trigger of that camera. And there were 13 gunshots right all around him. Bullets so hitting the concrete right next to him. He never flinched. Uh, the camera, the film was sold already to Life magazine for 150000 before it was ever shot. The film was processed in a laboratory in Dallas, Texas that was owned by the Murchison family. Uh, Eight frames were taken out of the Zabruder film. The film was never saw for a year. No one ever saw it until a year after the, after the, after the assassination. When they showed the film... And there were eight frames missing out of it. They showed the film for the first time on TV in the 70s. You're telling me that... Yeah, they did the FBI after the FBI got it and ordered it. But there were eight frames missing out of it. And what, what did those eight frames show? Showed the driver turn around and shoot Jack. The last shot came from the driver of the car. And has that been seen since? Yeah, that was what they showed on television. See, because I've seen, now I, I, I actually noticed that. I'm like, if you look at the, right at, I think it was frame 313, right? If you look at that moment, it does well, look you see, like. Well, you got to understand something. Here's, here's, here's all these shots being fired. The car, now here, first of all, you got the President of the United States in an open car going down Dealey Plaza, the Bird Building, which is the book depository, had all the windows open, people were walking around inside. That should never have happened with the President of the United States below it in an open car. You had people get off the train station walking across the bridge, one of them being Woody Harrelson's father, who was a hitman for New Orleans. Mm -hmm. There were 32, 32 people in Dean Plaza that day that could have killed Kennedy. Okay, now, just to kind of sum it all up, who... You you said I mean you earlier you mentioned his father his father was behind it but you said he didn't order it. Oh, his father his father angered a lot of people. Right. And what that created was the bankers of Geneva, whom he argued he the people he hurt the most were there. There were so many different things happening of angry people that they were played. The people in America, the CIA, the people in Dallas, all of them were played. Because a man from Europe set the whole thing up. It took them four months to reroute that thing down Dealey Plaza. Okay, so JFK, the, the the main figure in all of this was you he. Ever a, hear, you ever hear? You ever hear of a picture called the Jackal? No. 
You never heard the guy, a guy called the Jackal? <laughs> Who is that? The Jackal was the number one assassin in Europe. Okay. His name is Carlos Sanchez. There's a guy sitting in jail in France right now that they say is Carlos Sanchez, but he's not. He's sitting there doing time for the guy. He was the premier assassin in Europe. He set up the Kennedy hit at Dealey Plaza. And he fired what shot? He didn't fire any shots. <laughs> he raised his umbrella. Oh, to, 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 sign, to signal everything. So That's right. Okay, so who, who was firing the shots? The first shot came from a cauldron in the street. You know what a cauldron is? Right, yeah. Okay, that, that cauldron today has just been cemented in. That cauldron, I could stand in there, and I could walk from the river to that street in that cauldron. That's how big it was. Johnny Mazzelli was in the cauldron with a rifle. The first shot that hit Kennedy in the throat came from Johnny Mazzelli. That came from the back or front? Came from the front. That came from the front. Jack Kennedy never got... Jack Kennedy got shot in the back in the lower part of his back that never came out until 10 years later. And which bullet hit Kennedy? He got shot in the lower part of his back. The first shot hit him in the throat. He grabbed his throat and he fell forward on the Conley's body. Conley was the first one shot. Conley fell, Jack fell on top of him, and then the driver turned around and took the last shot, which you see Jack go flying backwards, because he shot him right in the forehead. I mean, I've I seen the footage, and it, it does appear like, like the driver does turn around and do that, but I mean, I'm just saying I saw a what looked to be a glare on the passenger's head that looked like it was the gun. I know you probably think that's ridiculous, but that's that's no, how I saw it. You can see it in his hand, actually. The footage that's, that is there, you actually see the gun in his hand, and you see the puff of smoke come out of it. I mean, yeah, I know the frame. And, I, and you I, got to understand, all this happened in 28 seconds. Okay, okay, let's put take away every all the background stuff that you know about Joe Kennedy, about the illness of JFK. Yeah. Take away yeah. all that stuff. Would it be yeah. possible for the greatest marksman in the world to be in the sixth floor of the book depository, whatever floor it was, I think that was it, to no. make to make those shots? No. Absolutely not. No, I you know, I'll tell you what, you ask any person who's a sniper, all mm -hmm. right, anybody who has any knowledge of a rifle. Right. And I and you ask him this question. They bought a mail order gun. That was a mail order rifle, okay? And it was a bolt action rifle. All right? Yeah. Now, for a person, for a gun, for a marksman, to take a shot of a thousand feet with a car moving, downgrade, wind there was so bad that the motorcycle cops couldn't even hear their microphones, the wind down in Dealey Plaza. Uh -huh. You had trees, signs, all obstacles. For a guy to take that shot, First of all, he has to arrest his heart down below 60 because his pulse is in his finger. Now, there's no way in God's name that guy takes three shots out of a bolt-action gun in 28 seconds. Impossible. Not, not Never, ever happen. The greatest shot in the world could make that. No. And it wasn't any, how could he shoot him from behind when you see his head blow out from the front? But if the bullet hits him in the, in, in, it looked like the side of the head, right? The right side? He got hit right in the front. The back of his head blew out. Jackie Kennedy, they said, was trying to collect his brains. It's bullshit. She was trying to get out of the car because she thought they were going to shoot her next. So why the hell didn't she say anything about the driver doing it? Because when they got her out of the car, if you, if you looked at the Zabuda film, you saw the Secret Service guy peeled away from Kennedy's car. When all the gunshots started, they had to run back up to the car, and they're running up to catch her coming out of the car. Right. And when she came out of the car, they whispered in her ear, if you open your mouth about what you just saw, we will kill your children. And she never opened her mouth. And that was Clint Hill who was jumping on the back of the car. He's the one that said it? That's right. All those Secret Service guys were at Jack Ruby's club the night before, and they all got envelopes. You understand so, that? So so Jack Ruby, in the end, when he took out Oswald, what was that about? Jack Ruby, Jack Ruby worked for the mafia. And Jack why? Ruby was a go-between between Cuba and America. 
So when Jack Ruby killed the Patsy Oswald, as you say, yeah. what was his motivation? How could how could Jack Ruby get into a place like that with a weapon on him if it wasn't orchestrated? Hey, I'm, I'm not... And when you... Who are the Oswald just shot the President of the United States? They would not say it was a federal case because they said it was a one-man conspiracy. It wasn't a group, so the feds can't get involved. Which is bullshit. He just shot the president. Yeah, right, right. right. They did not take one note. They did not tape one conversation of any of the interviews with him. There's no record of, of any interviews with Oswald. And when he came out into that garage, the guy that was standing next to him, the, the officer, if you looked at the footage, he stepped away from him. Yeah, there's no... As Ruby approached him. Right, right. And there is no question. Something, something is... There's a lot being hidden by uh, by the government and as to why they covered this up in so many ways. So, he was married to a Russian. His, they, they, they designed for him to go to Russia. He married a KGB daughter. Yeah. And he shot his mouth everywhere he lived over there. He kept moving from apartment to apartment. It was all bugged. And he kept talking, 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 talking. They threw him out of Russia. Now he's a throwaway. He wasn't even in the building when those shots were fired out of that window. So I guess it, it, it leads to the question, J.D. Tippett, what happened there? They killed. <laughs> <laughs> Tippett got killed. Tippett got killed. Exactly, there were two Tippets. Tippett got killed on movies on, on, on Oswald's way back home to the house where he was, where he was living at. And, and I had a writer go walk from the, the book depository, stop at the Tippett thing, and go to his house. It never happened in the time frame. Wow. Well, I mean, this is, so, so a lot of this is outlined in your book, Family Legacy, huh? Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, I mean, this is fascinating stuff. And if you guys want to hear hear more about it, pick up uh, pick up Jack's book. I mean, you, 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 the, the, here's the biggest thing that ever happened in our country, and they've lied about it for so long. So when, when did the planning first start, do you uh, assume? Five months before it happened. Mm-hmm. And that was... They, they, they were supposed to... That wasn't the route that he was supposed to take. And, and here's a good one for you. Who was the number one cop in the country when Jack Kennedy got killed? His brother. That's right, Attorney General. Yeah. And four people went to him, one of them being Adlai Stevenson, who had been in Texas right before Jack went down there. Four people went to him and said, do not let your brother go to Texas. There is so much animosity down there. He's in serious trouble if he goes there. Bobby Kennedy, who is his brother's second skin, his whole political career, everywhere Jack went, Bobby went. Bobby didn't go before. He wasn't there during, and he never went afterwards hmm. to Dallas, Texas. Yeah. Yeah, wow. And he was the number one cop in the country. Right. So you can go, they, they can put 30 theories around, and they can talk all kinds. Of, I was there. Yeah. They can talk all the bullshit they want. I was out doing my road work that morning, and I saw Johnny Rizal. He was running the same park I was. Wow. And he said to me, I thought you were supposed to leave town. I said, I'm getting on a plane in about an hour. He said, good, get out of here. So, so you can't, you know, you can't, you, the, the whole bullshit, there's more bullshit that flies around. And people buy it because this guy said it and that guy said it and this guy said it. But if you just sit there and look at the simple facts of what really happened, it all fits like a glove. I mean, I, I mean, you, I'm sure, you know, you do know that the uh, the amount of talk about this JFK thing has been, I mean, there, you know how many different speculations there have been. So I'm sure you've been called a conspiracy theorist, right? I, I, I don't, I, I never talk to political bullshit people. I don't, you know, <laughs> that's just some of my business. I, I know what happened. I was there. So and, I, and, and, and I'll tell you, Greer, Greer, on his deathbed, told his son what happened. His and son? his son has been on the Jesse Van, Van what's his name, show. Jesse. And he's told, huh? Jesse Ventura? Yeah. Yeah. He went on his show and he told the truth about what his father told him and showed him a document. That's that's the driver's son. Yeah. He died in Texas. Wow. Yeah, I mean that's it's it's really incredible stuff. So yeah, it's definitely fascinating and uh 
And uh, a lot of it's outlined in your book, Family Legacy, which I will leave a, a link to to the Amazon so people could check it out and uh, and uh, see for themselves, right? There you go. All right, very good. So so let's, you know, to, <laughs> <laughs> to get off of this for a minute and to just, as we wind down here, I do want to thank you again. This is Jack O'Halloran you're listening to here on The Rock Stop, who's been on a ton of stuff, a lot of movies, uh, most famously played non in uh, Superman 1 and 2. Uh, so just to finish off with some Superman stuff, since a lot of people want to hear about it, how long did you um, shoot on Superman 1? How, how long was that process? We shot, uh, well, we did both pictures at the same time. They were done simultaneously, we were both, that's right, yeah. We were shooting both pictures, so we, we worked about a year and a half, and then we went off. We were off for a couple months, and then we went back and worked for another year. Wow. Another year and a couple months. So you just had a, a couple months off during the whole production. So we were almost three years, I guess, all together. Wow, that's incredible. Yeah, so it wasn't shot back to back. It was shot simultaneously. Oh, no, we shot it simultaneously. Wow. Donner, Donner, that's why the Donner cut is as good as it is, because he had already shot 86% of the movie. Yeah, right. And then All the, that footage was there. Yeah, definitely a great point. So... uh it's been really great talking with you, Jack. I do appreciate you uh, taking time and uh, coming on the show. I appreciate it. We had a good time, man. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> definitely. Let, good. Me know. Let me know what your feedback is. It'll be interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I certainly will. So thanks again, Jack. Take care, man. Have a good day. All right, thanks. You too. Bye. Bye-bye.